Yeah. A few you all remember this little fella. Uh, this is the adapter bracket and piece of pipe work I made to fit the Mini's heat attack valve to the Micro's engine. The only issue that I have come across, and to be honest I probably should have seen this coming, is when I pull on the cable there, it has a tendency to flex the bracket, so it doesn't mean the valve always closes. And what I'm going to do is create an additional tab to pick up off another bolt down here to make this bracket a little bit more steady. The first step in fixing the flex in the heat attack bracket was to machine a small spacer. This was to take up the difference in height between the existing mountain bolt location and the new one that I was going to utilise. With the spacer machine down to size, I just needed to put the hole through the centre for the bolt. This started off with a centre drill before pilot drilling it and then taking it out to the correct size. The final step in making the spacer was to part it off. Now, I'll be honest with you, I hate parting stuff off on legs. Fortunately though, as this was such a small part, it wasn't that bad. With one of the smallest cardboard templates made as part of this project, I traced around it onto some steel before centre punching the position of the hole. This is the part that will join the existing bracket to the new bolt via the spacer. Ah, the joys of trying to find small parts that have fallen on the floor. Careful though, they may be hot. With all the parts held in position by bolting them in place, I could then weld them together. While I'm making alterations to the cooling system, I'm going to also need to adjust this little pipe. You probably remember my dad machined that for me a long time ago. And unfortunately, since I built an inlet manifold which blocks access to the pipe. So we're going to make a pipe cut in it and angle off somewhere in that direction so I can get the rubber hose from the heater onto it. Before removing the water pipe and cutting into it, it seemed a good idea to take some measurements of exactly where the pipe could go.
With the modification to the pipe made, all that was left to do was to refit it. With the engine on the engine stand, we can now look at finalising the alternator mounts. Now I knew full well when I made them that they were probably going to have to change, hence the reason I only tack welded them together. Something I didn't anticipate however was when I dropped the car back down on its wheels for the first time, it ended up compressing the rubber mounts between the subframe and the bodywork. This made the alternator a little bit too close to the bodywork for more comfort, so the first job is to drop this down by about 5mm. Now to help with the alignment between the alternator pulley and the lower crank pulley, I ended up making this medieval looking device. What this is is a piece of box section with enough packers to give me the correct spacing between this pulley and this pulley. If you remember back to when I first started looking at making the mounts to this, I actually needed to move it inboard a little bit and this one I'll be driven off the inner pulley. So, let's take this alternator off, cut my tacks out and reposition the alternator. With the mounting tabs removed, I then cleaned up the engine mount before marking their new position. With everything marked, it was then just a case of realigning it all before welding them back together. Come as no surprise that now that we've altered the bottom alternator bracket, the top one doesn't fit either. So again, I'm going to cut the tack welds out and change this part. With all the tack welds cut out and all the parts of the alternator setup that could be refitted bolted back onto the engine, a template was needed for the new part of the upper alternator bracket. With the template made, it was the usual matter of drawing round it onto some steel before drilling the hole and cutting it out.
With the part for the new top bracket made, I bolted it to the alternator to hold it in place, ready to be welded. With the alternator back on, we can now look at the last part of the accessory drive, that being the tensioner. Now, this is a tensioner pulley with an eccentric cam in the middle of it. I'm not sure what it's from, I believe it's some form of Reno, whatever it is, it's been lying around in my parts for years, so I'm going to use it. It needs to live somewhere around about here, which means we need to make a mounting bracket, ideally picking up off these three holes here. I've also got this cut belt, which we can use to determine the length and the route that's going to go around the pulleys. With the ends of the belt being held together at approximately the right length, I could position the pulley against it to determine a route that would not foul on anything. With this done, and with a clear idea now in my head of how to make the mounting bracket, I could once again crack out the cardboard. For those of you that are wondering, the slot I am marking out in the bracket corresponds with a tab on the eccentric pulley mount. This is needed for the mechanism to work properly. With the three mounting bolt holes drilled to clear M5 bolt, the centre hole was drilled and tapped out to M8 for the pulley mounting bolt. With all the holes filled and tapped, I then just had to cut the bracket out. Now I will admit that the first design of mounting studs didn't exactly work, and so what I'm showing you here is the Mark II version. I couldn't use M10 bolts to hold the idler pulley mount in place on the engine, as the heads of the bolts would have clashed with the belt. I couldn't use M10 countersinks or drill a counterbore hole for a cap head, as the plate wasn't thick enough. This meant I had to machine some studs that could be screwed into the engine, and that would allow a smaller M5 countersink fastener to screw into them. With the hole in the centre of the stud drill, the last step was to tap the hole. I used the lathe to hold the tap central when I started to create the thread before moving over to the vise and using the tapping wrench to finish them off. In case you're wondering, a total of three studs were made. With the tension of pulley sorted out, we can now remount the alternator and then measure up for a belt. I can however see a problem with this, but we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. That problem I just mentioned was the design of the Mark 1 mounting studs. However, with the problem not known at this point, the next step was to reef up the alternator so I could measure up for the belt. Right, it should be fairly obvious, but I'm going to say it anyway. When you're measuring up for your belt, obviously make sure that your tensioner is in its slackest position. I'd also advise you to befriend your local auto factors, because chances are you're going to be going back there a few times swapping belts. I've also found in my experience that your local independent ones tend to be a bit more helpful as they can fix your catalogs and find the right part rather than some of the big name brand ones where they just ask you for a registration. Obviously we can give you a registration of an engine swap car, it's not much use. 
Now, when measuring for a belt, I advise you to use an actual old belt that's been cut. I have done this previously with bits of wire and string, but they always have a tendency to stretch. The belts don't tend to do that um, because they're wider, it's easier to put a mark on them and see it rather than misjudging it. So uh, let's wrap this round and get it as tight as we can and then take some measurements. With the belt wrapped around the auxiliary drive system and a mark made, it was then just a case of lying it out flat on the bench and measuring it. I'll make that 948. So I've got to look up what the nearest belt size is for that. With the tension of fully sorted out and a trip to my local auto factors plan to go get a belt, we can now move our attention to sorting out the temperature sensor. Now this is a mini temperature sensor. It has a 5 8 U and F thread and an overrating between 1.7 and 0.1 kilo ohms. This is the micro temperature sensor. It has an M12 by 1.25 thread and a rating between 2.1 and 0.3 kilo ohms. I want to use a standard mini's instrument cluster. So unfortunately, if I use it with the micro temperature sensor, I'm gonna get an inaccurate reading and a gauge which gives me inaccurate reading really isn't a lot of use. Therefore, I really need to fit the mini's temperature sensor to the micro block. Now the micro engine actually has two temperature sensors. One that sends data to the ECU, which allows it for correct running and fueling, etc. And the other, which just sends a signal back to the instrument cluster. This is fortunate because that means I can replace our second temperature sensor, this one, with the minis. For some of you out there that are probably now thinking, well, go on then, just re-drill and tap the block and screw the mini temperature sensor in. Unfortunately, where it's positioned, there isn't enough material or depth to allow me to do that. The obvious solution to this then is to use an adapter. Unfortunately, despite my best efforts, I've not been able to find one. I did find one, but it was in the States, so it was going to take 16 weeks to get here, and it was $47 plus shipping plus taxes. I don't have 16 weeks to wait because I want to try and get that car ready for a trip that's coming up soon, so instead I'm going to put that money towards the tools and make one. I'm sure there is someone right now furiously typing away in the comments about to tell me that I'm an idiot, followed by them inevitably posting a link to the wrong adapter. Trust me, I have tried finding one. I don't like making parts if I don't have to, but this seems to be such a reoccurring problem that I've even had a couple of people approach me and ask me to make them an adapter for their own conversion. If you know where I can buy one though, I am happy to be proven wrong. With the outside machine down to size, the next step was to drill the hole down the centre. We started with a centre drill before being followed up with a 5mm pilot drill and then taken out to the correct tapping size. With the necessary hole drilled down the middle, the last step before it could be transferred over to the milling machine was to add a small chamfer. In order to fit the adapter in place, I had to use a socket and so needed to machine six flaps onto it rather than just two. I had to use a socket to fit it as I couldn't get an open-ended spanner in position when screwing the adapter into the engine block. In order to machine the six flaps on the part all perfectly 60 degrees to one another, it requires the use of a dividing head, some maths and a Simon. A uh, big thanks to my colleague at work who showed me how to set up the dividing head.
and if there's a flat machine, I then just had to repeat the process five more times. There you go. Three quarter inch flats. Uh, I will admit this is Mark II because Mark I, I don't know what went wrong, but it turned out as a complete disaster. Right, this has got to go back in the lathe, and we've got to turn down the other end and put the M12 by one thread on it. And the final step was to thread the outside with the necessary M12 by 1.2 thread. I'm going to end the episode here. If you've enjoyed this episode, then please hit that like button and share. If you want to keep up to date with the build, then please subscribe to my channel and you can follow my build thread on the mini forum, the link to which is in the description below. Once again, thanks for watching. Yeah.